Hi, my name is Joris Gilles, and as one of the Kasadi authors, I would like to give you a small Kasadi tutorial today. So Kasadi is a framework for efficient nonlinear optimization, and I will explain this tutorial in three parts. First, a high-level overview of Kasadi, and then two practical code demonstrations where I will use the example of a parallel kinematic robot. Now, Kasadi, uh, I will demonstrate Kasadi uh, with the help of this mechanical engineering problem, but it's more applicable than just to the mechanical domain, of course. Uh, as a general flow, how do you use Kasadi? Uh, and I will give more details later. later. You first define a system based on your engineering um, application. Then you define concrete mathematical problems based on that system and then you solve or deploy uh, these problems. Okay, so if I think in terms of uh, mechanical engineering, you could say your system could be uh, a model of your system, which could be static, uh, kinematic or dynamic. And you typically will get uh, differential equations or algebraic differential equations. Then what kind of problems can we define based on that system? So we can do initial value problems, integration problems, we can do root finding, nonlinear constraint optimization, which is really the core, um, and then we can start solving these problems, and for this we have a lot of uh, numerical backends to third-party solvers, some of them open source, such as IPOPT, some of them closed source, such as uh, SNOPT. Um, other types of plugins we have to solve problems would be CVODS, that's a special adaptive step size integrator, and then a whole bunch of quadratic problem uh, solvers. So that was very high level. Um, Effect Cassadi, um, the flow that I just indicated to define a system and define a problem based on the system, it doesn't need to be one directional. So you can, in fact, uh, in several steps, make your problem uh, more complicated. For example, I will demonstrate how to embed a root finding problem back into the system definition. Uh, and afterwards, you can again go to the right and do, for example, an integration. So what are some of the capabilities of Kasadi, or how does a typical flow look like? You start with expression graphs. And expression graphs represent a computation in the computer memory. Um, in fact, expression graphs are so important that our logo is in fact an expression graphs, graph where the nodes are the red uh, circles and the, the incoming or out, outgoing edges are the black lines. With expression graphs you can create functions and functions you can evaluate, hopefully efficiently. So that's the very basic. So if we go a little bit more in depth, so expressions or expression graphs, they grow as you apply mathematical operations. So you may start here at the top of the expression graph with inputs or, or symbols, and then you can do operations that combine sub results uh, and so on. So as long as you're doing mathematical operations, you stay in the expression domain. Uh, we also do algorithmic differentiation, hence the AD in Kasadi. Uh, and that's an operation that acts on expression graphs, you could say. And the result of doing a differentiation is again an expression graph. And you can do this as many times as you want to get higher order derivatives. Um, we have this subtle distinction in Kasadi, in fact, where we have two different types of expression graphs. We have a scalar graph where the, the nodes are scalar components or numbers. And we also have a, a type called MX where the nodes are matrices and in fact uh, sparse matrices. Um, once we have this uh, definition, so this definition of the, of the system or the computation, we can go to functions. Um, we can also go back, so we can evaluate a function not only numerically, so that would be this arrow, but we can also call it symbolically, and then we would be back in the expression graph domain. So you'll see you're manipulating these concepts or instances of these concepts, and you can yeah, go back and forth as you like. Simplest 
type of a function would be a mapping from a set of symbols to a set of output expressions. All the types of functions are uh, the ones that relate to this problem definition. So a root finder, the result of a root finder would be a function. The result of an integrator would be a function, a QP solver, NLP solver. Uh, what can we do more? So functions can also be co-generated often. So then you have uh, uh, some kind of self-contained C code that you can deploy. Uh, in fact, uh, you can put this one step further and we have an FMU uh, export in Kasadi 3.6, which is currently the latest. And we also have an export to uh, MATLAB uh, S functions, such that you can drag and drop uh, a function into a simulink scheme. Uh, other things you can do is save and load uh, of functions. And in fact, this is very handy if you are developing a product um, with several developers in MATLAB and several in Python. And the way they can interact is by going through uh, saving and loading. So I will also demonstrate this in my later demo. Uh, what are some of the options to define your system? So you can do it from scratch by just having symbols and then writing your, your uh, vector or matrix operations on top of them. There are also some import facilities around that couple with other modeling tools. Um, so we can import uh, FMU models. So there was an FMU export and also an import. For example, you can get uh, models from, from Modelica. Um, you can also subclass uh, our callback class and then you can do couplings with other AD tools such as TensorFlow and PyTorch. Um, we can also uh, overload the virtual machine and um, put in other uh, concepts for symbolic computation. So MuPad here is the, um, the MATLAB counterpart or the, the MATLAB built-in symbolic manipulation tool. And for uh, Python, you have something similar, SymPy. So we can also have, uh, up to some level, we can do conversions between uh, these different systems. Um, other things you can do, so there have been projects where we try to parse uh, Simscape uh, diagrams. There is also a project where we can parse directly Modelica code without going through the FMU model exchange uh, format. Uh, what is the whole aim of this? So, uh, in general, we would like to support mathematical engineers, engineers with doing their uh, daily business. Uh, Kasadi is fully open source, so permissively licensed, and we kind of want to offer it as a foundation to build upon. And in fact, you may find many packages or libraries that are in some way or another importing or relying on Kasadi. Um, and through these um, save and load functionalities, uh, we would also like to at some point become a lingua franca for uh, mathematical, uh, concrete mathematical engineering uh, problem definitions. All right, so that's enough high level stuff. Let's jump to the code demonstration. So as I said, I will first start in MATLAB. Uh, right, so I'm do going to do a parallel kinematic robot. So we'll have three uh, linear slides that are, we could say, mounted in the in the working space. Um, so I'll make this plot here. So these three uh, black bars are the linear slides, and by um, moving, you could say, the card on the slide we can place these points in space. So this plot is just for a visualization, nothing special is happening yet. So what we want to do uh, later is um, talk about the center point. So this would be the connection between all cards, all three cards uh, coming together. So you could imagine here, each of those dotted lines would be a solid uh, uh, beam or a bar. And when you connect all of them in a joint, um, you would have a center point that moves as you move the slide, the, uh, 
the linear guides. So in, the, in this plot, the center point is still static, so it's kind of dummy, but you will get the idea. So how do we approach this? And I'm not saying this is the best way to approach it. It's just an example to, uh, that uh, brings together some Kasari concepts. So obviously we import Kasari, and now we make some symbols to represent the position of the uh, card on the linear slide. So uh, I think the definition is that it should be between 0 and 1. But it's not, not so important yet. So I give the slide positions a, a name. So these become workspace variables. Um, and let's also make a symbolic uh, vector for the center point. Uh, what we want to find out first is uh, what center point, what C vector satisfies this distance relation. So for all i, uh, going from 1 to 3, we want to have that the position of the card uh, given a certain slide um, position. So yeah, as, as is like uh, a 1D distance and P would be the 3D position in space. So the full Cartesian position of um, the slide, uh, of slide 1, 2 and 3, minus uh, or, or distance with respect to the C, the center point should always give a fixed length. And the nature of this problem is really, um, yeah, it's a set of nonlinear equations that need to be satisfied, so we call it a root finding uh, problem. Um, so let's check here. So how do we do a root finding problem in, in uh, Kasadi? We set up structure structure or dictionary in Python. Then we have this keyword, so the, the, this would be the unknowns. So my unknowns are C. And C is the three vector that we have here. What are the constraints? So G I use as a label to indicate the, the constraints or the, the thing that needs to be driven to zero. And in this case, uh, I use this workspace variable, so it's this expression. So just the, the norm distance, the norm or the distance, minus L vectorially. So all these three needs to be satisfied. Um, so that, that's basically the problem. And then for our purposes, um, S, so the position, the concrete position of the slide is kind of a parameter. So the solver or the root finder should not, should, should just take those for granted and not try to uh, move them about. So one of the first concepts uh, in, in Kasari when you go to the function block uh, was this root finder. So let's let's give it a name. Let's choose a backend, which is a Newton type, and then we give in the problem definition. Uh, solver would be uh, so the data type of solver is a Kasari function, and we can call it numerically uh, using these numbers to get a result, and then we can also plot it. So let's do that. Um, so as I move, whoops, this one is nicer. So as I move one of the slides, we should be able to see, it's not very clear yet, we should be able to see the center point move here as a result of this movement. So every time I slide, a root finding problem is solved in the background. Uh, obviously we can also change the, uh, the rest length. Let's keep it at this. All right, so that's nice. Uh, let's take it one step further uh, and, and demonstrate some more capabilities of Kasari. We're going to make uh, a nice mapping function uh, between the, uh, the given linear slide position, so S. So we just name S the concatenation of S1 through uh, S3. We call the solver uh, this time not numerically, but symbolically. And then as a result, we will have a struct of expressions. And with these expressions, we can build functions or mappings. So we can say, uh, please give me a function that maps between the slide positions and the solved for center position. Uh, and since solver is still yeah, a root finder, uh, a canonical problem, we have the standard labels to signify the, uh, the unknowns, which were the x's. 
But we know better, we know the, the, uh, the concrete semantics of, of the, or, or the quantities that we gave it. So here we can give extra labels to make the function printout more readable. So let's try this. So we'll see that uh, fc, which is the, the label we gave to the function, is a mapping from s to c. Uh, so these s and c are taken from these uh, definitions here. And we'll see that s is a tree vector and c is a tree vector. Uh, so we're going to make it slightly more interesting still and do some kind of linearization. I'm going to grow this first. So what I'm doing here, and you don't need to read through all this, uh, the details here, but I'm, I'm kind of perturbing the slide position. So I'm, I'm generating a thousand perturbations uh, of random Gaussian noise on top of the nominal S's that uh, I picked earlier. So that's, that would be these S combinations. So I do some, some perturbations and then I just call my C function, my FC, uh, with these whole times, with this whole series of perturbed S's. So this would be three by thousand, as you can see. So all kinds of, of perturbed S's and all, and what comes out is perturbed uh, center position. So you can see this, this map here, whoops. Okay. Good. Um, with all this data, you can find a covariance matrix. So that's what, what this uh, line does. And we can also inspect the eigenvalues uh, of this matrix. Uh, why do I do this? Because I want to demonstrate something uh, here. So this would be, the above would be the empirical way to get uh, an estimate of, of uh, covariance. You can also use a, a linearized property of the mapping itself. So we had this mapping F. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry, I used the symbol F here, but I, I really mean the FC here, but okay. So the covariance of the output of the mapping is in fact given, and I, I will not give the proof, but the first to, up to four, first order approximation, you can equate this to the covariance of the input, uh, so the, the slide positions in our case, and then left and right multiplied with the Jacobian of this mapping. Um, and yeah, so the thing is that Casali provides you easily gradients, Jacobians, hashes, etc. So this is a good example of demonstrating how you work with Jacobians. Um, so in order to take a Jacobian with, with Casali, you need an expression first. Uh, so let's, let's create an expression by passing the set of symbols S into uh, the function FC. And now uh, we can do a new mapping. So Jacobian FC, which would be a mapping between the slide inputs and the Jacobian of this expression with respect to S. So the result of that, um, that would be kind of this DF DX thing. Um, so we can evaluate this in the, the nominal point. Now we have a, G, a concrete G and then, you, then we can left and right multiply it with the input covariance. And hopefully we would kind of get something that matches. Uh, yeah, so it, it doesn't match perfectly and that's because I grew the perturbation size quite big. And yeah, it's only a first order approximation. So let's, let's make this a, a bit smaller. So this would be the new um, eigenvalues. Oops. Okay, so that's a bit of a better match now. Okay, let's make it uh, or extend it into another direction. What if we have limited stiffness of the bars that connect the slides or the cards and the center point? Um, so I'm going to demonstrate uh, uh, a nonlinear problem for this, and we're going to optimize for energy. So I'm going to work towards a, an expression for potential energy using components of gravity and components of a spring. Um, the gravity is quite easy, so it's just m mass times gravity acceleration times the center point, and if you like, you can also add the um, contributions of the slides. 
Um, and then the spring. Uh, for the spring potential energy, you need the rest length. And I prepared here a little expression to have the deviation um, of the springs from rest length. So this could be this becomes a static uh, problem, right? So we have to minimize the potential energy, and we will find kind of the static equilibrium of this system. Um, so how do we define a nonlinear problem? So in this case, we have decision variables here, and our decision variables are the centroid because we're interested in how much it sags down um, by gravity. The objective is the potential energy, uh, and some of the parameters are the, the concrete slide positions and the concrete length of the, of the beam. Um, right, solved. And then if we vary the stiffness, we should be able to see, so if, if we are less stiff, we get a more saggy behavior in red versus the black uh, nominal robot position. Uh, and every time I drag the slider, that is a nonlinear uh, problem being uh, solved. Great, okay. Now, my background is mechanical engineering, in fact, so I'm a bit biased to this topic. So I want to introduce one, one extra bit of mechanical engineering, and that is Lagrangian dynamics uh, as a way to derive uh, system equations. Uh, and Lagrangian dynamics works with generalized coordinates and generalized forces. So I'm, I'm going to, to do the full dynamics of this robot now, of this flexible robot. Um, so I'm going to say my generalized coordinates are first the card positions uh, and the forces is going to be the forces that act on the, on the slides. So this is kind of going to be kind of a, a force controlled uh, robot, you could say, just for the fun of it. Um, so slide position and center point are the coordinates and then we have to uh, set up the Lagrangian and then do this derivation and obtain the, uh, the dynamics from that. So I introduced this helper operator here so that to get total time derivative. Um, so that just uses a, an internal Cassadi construct, which is similar to uh, Jacobian times a vector, but more efficient. Um, so what are the positions of the slides? They are just the, the total uh, differential of the position, uh, of the Cartesian position of the card uh, at a certain slide uh, position. We do this for all these and we can get a uh, a total kinematic energy, which has a part of the card and part of the center point where we also have a, a mass. Then the Lagrangians is given by the difference. We pick a symbol to represent the forces that act along the linear slides. And then we can uh, tackle this equation. So I'm just gonna literally write this formula here. Uh, and this equation we need to solve. And it's going to be a second order differential equation in Q. So Q dot dot is what we're after. So we want to solve this for Q dot dot. Now, um, luckily we know, uh, or mechanical engineers know, that Q dot dot, uh, or that this equation is in fact linear in Q dot dot. So we can use a linear solve. So that's what we're gonna do. So we're gonna solve uh, this equation. Um, by kind of, um, so it's a linear system and we can linearize it with Jacobian and then we can just uh, do the inverse or, or the solve and we get the result. So this would become a, an exp so DDDQ solve becomes an explicit expression for the, uh, the generalized acceleration of the system. Okay, that's a lot of talking. So in fact, when you, when you uh, display expressions, you will see something that doesn't look very human readable. And that's, that's kind of a decision we made in Casadi. So Casadi is made for machine efficiency, not so much readability. 
So you have to trust us that this expression does the right computation. Uh, here I'm demonstrating uh, an, an addition to uh, the latest Casari, so 3.6. So we have now uh, a routine to, to do common sub-expression elimination. And in some complex cases, the, this can reduce the size of the computational graph, which would translate in faster evaluation speed. So if you wonder where these uh, common sub-expressions may come from, I'm, I'm taking all these time derivatives uh, independently of each other, instead of all together. So this is, yeah, for didactical purposes, I didn't make this most efficient. Uh, but thanks to this function, it is now very efficient. So no problem with that. Um, so what do we have more? Uh, we want to work towards a differential equation. And we're going to integrate. And in the Python world, we're going to even solve optimal control with this. So how do we create a, an ODE from this? So an ODE for Cassad is just a function that maps between uh, states, controls, and parameters uh, up to the right hand side, so the dx, dt. So I'm just going to write this as a Cassad function. So the full state space is going to be q and dq, uh, because we want to bring it in, in a first order uh, recipe instead of a, a second order differential equation. So this would be the states. I give it also a handy label. Uh, this, these are the controls of the, the, uh, the forcings. Um, and then the size of L is still a parameter. Uh, and yeah, okay. So the output expression, the dq part is very simple. We just uh, shuffle the input forward. And then this one is going to be the, the more nice one. Uh, I'm going to save this expression to the disk because I later want to use this in Python. And we can also do things like, again, whoops. Um, we also want to do things like, um, for example, uh, analyze the, uh, the system, the linearization of the system dynamics. So that's what this plot is about. Um, so here I, I create an expression again, and I do the Jacobian with respect to Q and DQ. So as you see in the sparsity pattern, um, this the first block is quite simple because I'm just I'm just uh, shifting the incoming input further as an identity. So that's what this diagonal thing is, and this block is more complex. So this is DDQ sol with respect to uh, Q, I think, yeah. Um, and yeah, this, this sparsity pattern is not numerical, so I, I didn't pick a, any linearization point. This is a structural sparsity pattern. And Casari just computes it for you um, like that. Okay, final thing. So we can, of course, also define an initial value problem. Uh, so you define states, controls, parameters. You define the ODE. You pick an integrator like CVODS, which is uh, an adaptive step size integrator. Uh, pick a time grid, and then you can have some, some small simulation of the system basically falling down. All right, enough of the MATLAB world. But let's switch to Python. Uh, so now, now I'm in a Python environment. I'm going to load this F function that I just saved earlier. And to repeat, it is a differential equation, so ordinary differential equation that maps between states, controls, and a parameter onto uh, the right hand side of the ODE, so dx dt. Um, so this is uh, dimension is 12. Uh, we, we started with three slides plus three uh, center points, and then we had to double it in order to bring this uh, second order system back into a, a first order uh, form. So let's let's play a bit further with this. So uh, what configuration uh, or, or what quantities of S and forces uh, are needed to hold the robot in place? So that's like a steady state problem. And you could answer this problem as an uh, optimization. Um, 
It's a bit overkill. You could also do it root finding, but um, nonlinear program programming has this nice uh, high level uh, uh, abstraction also, and I also would like to demonstrate it. So under the hood, uh, this is going to map to NLP solve that we saw earlier, uh, but a bit nicer syntax. So we we start an optimization environment. Yeah, sorry for the noise. Um, it's not stopping. Right. So we 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 have a clear optimization environment. Uh, opti. We declare decision variables three by one uh, for the for the um, the forcing and also for the slides. Uh, then we evaluate our differential equation. Um, so we're gonna say, yeah, okay, the slides is, is an input, so we, we, we need to pass that on to the first input, and also a bunch of uh, zeros. So what these zeros mean, the first three zeros mean this, right, that we want C to be in the origin, and then the other zeros, they come from steady state desire, so like the derivatives of S and C are, are also zero. Um, also, the, the uh, control input is as of yet unknown, uh, but we need to pass it, and uh, we have our parameter also. Uh, so what we could do to, to find steady state is just minimize the norm of this, uh, of this uh, derivative, and hopefully it becomes zero. Uh, yeah, so this is quite close to, oh, it's numerically zero, effectively. Um, and then, um, we can query the result of the optimization by passing here a symbol or an expression and we will get some concrete outputs for S and uh, I don't know why they're, why they're hidden. Yeah, okay, anyway. Um, you could do some basic checks. You could say, yeah, is it really true that the gradient vanishes for this problem? So you could say, and this is a demonstration that you can put more complex expression inside of solve value. So what this line is saying is at the solution, what is the value of the gradient of the objective with respect to the decision variables? And if you paid attention in optimization class, we should know that this thing is supposed to be zero. And as a matter of fact, it is close to zero. Um, you could also think about second order conditions. So is the solution unique? Uh, so if, if the Hessian has positive uh, eigenvalues everywhere, uh, this means that the solution is unique. So we might in fact just ask for the Hessian. So we just ask for the Hessian of f with respect to x, evaluate it and look at the eigenvalues. And you will see that all of them are positive. So we have in fact a um, unique solution. All right, uh, let's do an, an optimal control problem also. Yeah, and we're almost done. So uh, let's do a time horizon of uh, five seconds. And we pick a certain number of, of discrete intervals we where we can apply piecewise constant controls. So that's what we typically do in Casadi. Uh, let, let's do it simple and use a tracking objective. Uh, I mean, on a regular basis, we solve optimal control problems with, with more advanced objectives than this, but this is just a demonstration. So uh, basically, uh, we have this desired uh, space curve and we like to know how to control the robot. So what, what torques to apply to follow this uh, shape in, in 3D and we solve it as an optimal control problem. Um, and in fact, it starts with a discretization. So we're gonna do uh, a direct method uh, for optimal control, which means we first discretize and then optimize. And that will be quite literal. So we will discretize using an integrator and then later on optimize. So we start from the uh, continuous dynamic, small f, and we work towards a big f. And I think I'm gonna skip through the details here and just gonna sh share with you what the meaning of big f is. 
so big F is also mapping from states controls parameters to the next uh, to the state at the next point in time. So discrete and uh, dt in fact here is the uh, step that we're taking. So we're taking a step dt forward in, in time and we want to know how our system evolved in that um, period. So going from x to x next. So yeah, so the current state uh, control parameter and then you get the next at a distance dt. Um, and with the help of this big F, we can now uh, do, for example, a shooting method, or multiple shooting methods. And that's, that's a specific strategy for optimal control. Um, the thing is, we want to know a control uh, trajectory. So a trajectory of, of uh, accelerations that will give us this nice tracing behavior. So that's what we really want to know. Uh, we also make the state decision variables when we do multiple shooting. That's, that's kind of yeah, the idea of multiple shooting. Um, and so we, we add a lot of degrees of freedom and to compensate we need to add a lot of uh, constraints also. So that's what we call gap closing. So what is the idea of multiple shooting here? We made all these states, so x, x is the full state, but it's, it's composed of these several components. So the idea is that we use our discrete, discretized system, big F, to um, constrain relationships, relationships between states. So xk, uh, or, or the slide, the kth column of, of the x matrix, um, will be used to predict the, uh, the k plus one component. And our prediction, the prediction of the model, should be exactly equal. So we, we kind of want to find the x trajectory that makes this an equality, so that obeys the system dynamic, system dynamics. And this is, yeah, you could, if, if I write it like this, you could say this is the residual or the gap between what the model says and what the optimizer thinks uh, where x should be. So if, and if you satisfy that constraint, you have effectively closed the gaps. Um, so as I said, we want to do a tracking objective. So let's just say we're interested in the center point C and we just subtract the reference and then put some norm on it. So sum of squares. And that's what we want to minimize. We are uh, in the constraint optimization domain, so we can just happily add, add more constraints, so inequalities. So this is kind of a funny syntax. These extra parentheses, you should think them away. Um, so this is saying uh, S or the, the slides, the trajectory of the linear slide should be between zero and 1.5. The controls uh, or the accelerations or forces, I don't remember if I have the masses in there. This should be between minus 10 and 10. And then we also have some periodicity, um, which I just, uh, because the reference is periodic, why not? Um, yeah, it's always a good idea to provide some initial guesses. So here I just have a, a repetition of the nominal values. You pick a solver, so IP opt, and you uh, do the solution, you retrieve the center point um, trajectory, and then you can make some plots. Um, yeah. So here the red is overlaid on the it's on the black and the residual is quite small, so on the order of uh, yeah, this number. Um, so you can extend this again in a whole lot of, of things. You can go for design problems where you say, I, I want to design this robot and I, I don't know what what else should be. Uh, you can think of, of uh, bringing the stiffness again um, and, and, and do some kind of trade-off between response and stiffness. Uh, so I won't go into all these details. Um, 
maybe yeah one one feature that I talked about is the code generation. So it's as simple as taking your Kasadi function and doing a generate FC, and then it will generate a, a bunch of um, C code that you can couple to applications. Uh, I think this, yeah, maybe the 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 latest uh, or the last example. Um, showing off some Kasadi features. So it's again a Jacobian. Um, and yeah, you see we're, we're kind of in this loop, we're kind of integrating symbolically. So we start with a, a symbolic state. Uh, we also have symbolic uh, controls. Ah no, not symbolic, numerical. So it's kind of mixed numerical symbolic. So X, XK is symbolic. This is numeric, so we inject the, the found trajectory. And then we're interested in kind of the periodic stability. So if you would apply this torque, so you, this, the result of this optimization gives you a torque signal. And if you would just apply this torque signal uh, and repeat it all the time indefinitely, then this monotromy uh, matrix would give you a sense of stability. Uh, and you can in fact see that we are not stable at all. So we get um, eigenvalues that are way beyond the unit circle. So this robot uh, force controlled, and yeah, force controlled typically is not uh, open loop stable. Uh, a whole lot of talking. So I hope you had a nice idea of some of the capabilities of Kasari, even if mechanical engineering is not your cup of tea. If you want to know more, you can always look at the website. And if you feel uh, feel like getting to uh, getting to really um, more detail uh, on Kasadi and get get it in the fingers, there is often uh, workshops uh, that that uh, I give. So either uh, physical or online, and these things you can all find on the Kasadi website. So with that, I'd like to thank you for your uh, patience and going through the whole of this talk. So all the best and perhaps see you later.